So uh, one of the main challenges now is, is first off cost. So the cost of sequencing a tumor genome and also uh, will match normal so healthy cells to find only the unique mutations to the tumor uh, is anywhere from about $2,000 to $4,000, uh, just the upfront cost depending on the center and how pure that tumor sample is. Uh, then we have a lot of bioinformatics associated costs. So the, the analysis uh, needs to be done by a large or a, a well-versed bioinformatics center. Typically that requires a lot of infrastructure to do this kind of analysis since we're dealing with very big files. Uh, thankfully in Canada and Toronto, we're very well set up. We have a service called the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, which can do this uh, on a fee basis for any requesting clinician. Uh, we work normally with clinicians in the area. Um, but that, that is one challenge. Another challenge is just overall trying to improve the sensitivity. So when we're detecting 10,000 somatic mutations, we have to differentiate between those which are CHIP, so mutations that are likely benign and not contributing to the disease, and those that are um, not CHIP and actually associated with a malignancy. So one way that we're trying to differentiate that signal from the noise is by looking at the fragment length. So how long is the DNA fragment with that mutation in the peripheral blood? Uh, but this is still a, a work in progress and we'll need to do a bit more. There's still a bit more work that can be done uh, to improve the sensitivity even further. So another, another way which we're looking to do that is by looking at the nucleosome accessibility in the cell-free DNA. And the idea behind this is when we look at all of the DNA that we receive in the blood and we map it to genome coordinates, like places in, in the genome, we don't see an even amount of DNA all throughout. We see places with a lot of DNA and places with very little. And through sequencing technologies, for example, like ATAC-seq, which has been done on bone marrow cells, this looks at the chromatin accessibility. So essentially the DNA is wrapped around these proteins called nucleosomes, and then uh, if it's very open, and there's typically more transcription. And then if there's a lot of nucleosomes closely packed together, we don't see as much transcription. So based on these chromatin accessibility technologies, we know regions in the genome where we're likely to see open DNA uniquely in myeloma and not in healthy controls. Now, thankfully, the DNA that we receive uh, from a blood draw is highly fragmented. And that DNA, which isn't protected by a nucleosome, gets very degraded. So we see very low amounts of DNA fragments in those regions compared to the DNA that was protected by a nucleosome, we tend to see a lot more of that. So we're looking to use this information. For example, the, the coverage of DNA at sites that we'd only expect there to be uh, a lot or not a lot of DNA in myeloma to further enhance the sensitivity of our tool. So we really think this is just the beginning of the possibilities of the kinds of data we can extract from cell-free DNA in order to better help a patient understand if they're at high or low risk of progression. And in the future, as we get more clinical trials looking at potentially stopping maintenance therapy based on MRD status or uh, modifying treatment regimens based on MRD status, we hope that this kind of technology will help patients get better treatment for them. And whether, whether that's treatment that's better able to target their myeloma subtype through the kinds of mutations that we can detect uh, or help them not have to come into a center as often uh, or potentially come back for a, a new treatment sooner uh, based on what we believe to be the emergence of a new clone. I hope all this can help improve outcomes for patients.